behalf of the Watson Institute for International Studies and together with my co-organizer, Mark Blythe, I'm very pleased to welcome you to this third discussion of the European Union in a moment of crisis. My name is Michael Kennedy and I am director of the Watson Institute. In this session, following two extraordinary sessions yesterday, the first on enlargement, the second on financial crisis, today we're going to be talking about the European Union and foreign policy. <coughs> We have with us two people who need no introductions, especially after yesterday's lengthier ones, but just for those of you who were not here, to remind you. Seated to my right is uh, Romano Prodi, who was Prime Minister of Italy and President of the European Commission. He is, even more distinctively, a Brown Professor at Large, located here at the Watson Institute. Alfred Gusenbauer, <coughs> former Chancellor of Austria, has had many important roles beyond that country as well, especially within the Socialist International, and equally distinctively is a visiting professor of international studies here at the Watson Institute. They are both extraordinary colleagues of great vision, and I feel especially fortunate to be here at Brown because they are my colleagues, and we all should be very fortunate, feeling very fortunate, we are very fortunate, we should be feeling very fortunate to have them in our midst. I can only envy, I have to say, all the students who have a chance to learn directly from them. I wish I had that chance when I was your age. So, we are going to follow yesterday's precedent, and I feel some kind of echo. Is the echo? Uh, we're going to follow yesterday's precedent and draw on questions initially that were provided to us from scholars from across Europe and North America. Uh, following the invitation that we offered, anticipating their visit. But we will conclude rather quickly and open it up to discussion. But please remember, even if you can't get everything covered this afternoon, tonight there's an event you don't want to miss at 7 o'clock. We will be discussing the European Union and whether its future is past. And our colleague, Professor Mark Blythe, will be offering the most provocative hypothesis. I suspect powerfully rebutted, and at least visions made. So, today, talking about the European Union and foreign policy, we entitled this Norms, Nations, and Power. Now, yesterday we talked about enlargement, and that's a kind of foreign policy, one might say a kind of strategy for democracy's extension through inclusion. But today we're focused much more on those beyond the enlargement prospect, whether we're talking about Belarus, Ukraine, and Russia on the one hand, or also we could be thinking about those other regions even further beyond the European enlargement prospect, whether in Afghanistan, Pakistan, and Iraq, or the Horn of Africa and the Great Lakes. Indeed, President Prodi has just been involved with the latter, having been at the United Nations this week in his capacity as chairman of the United Nations African Union Panel for Peacekeeping in Africa, where he made several recommendations on support for the African Union in particular. So there are many places in which the EU and its prominence are present, but we might take that as our first point of departure and lead it and take up the most obvious question. Is there a coherence to European Union foreign policy? Some would argue that there can be no coherence because of the continued significance of nations and their governments in making that foreign policy. In fact, one of our colleagues, Neil Flickstein, said European Union common and foreign security policy remains stuck. What do you think are the core underlying issues? Do you think they can be resolved once and for all by an agreement amongst the member states? Or is such a policy going to be continued to be dependent on the issues at hand? Well, I think that uh, foreign and security policy and the competence for that issues most probably might be 
the last one, whenever, that is transferred from the national level to the European level. Because uh, questions of uh, peace and war, uh, under the circumstances we are facing politically, uh, still will remain with <coughs> the national decision makers. And uh, I think many, many stages of European integration will have to happen till we are coming to a point <coughs> when these competences are moved to the European level. Nevertheless, uh, I think that uh, gradual <coughs> progress is possible. Uh, when you are looking into the Lisbon Treaty, theoretically, this is uh, a quite big step forward because uh, we agreed to have a permanent president of the European Council, which by definition is not a foreign policy uh, position, but it would create an image, or it will be a face of Europe in the world. The second, more important position will be the high representative uh, of the European Union for foreign affairs. So one might argue that we have such a position already, <coughs> and it's occupied by uh, Javier Solana. But the main difference is that under the new treaty provision, the high representative uh, uh, for foreign security policy at the same time will be vice president of the European Commission. So it could be that this person uh, is the most powerful and influential uh, person in the setting of the European institution because it's the only person who has one leg in the European Council and one leg in the European Commission. And this is uh, a very unique position that will, of course, lead to a situation where uh, the person that uh, will obtain the position of the high representative will be much more influential and much more powerful than the high representative is right now. Because uh, the high representative so far has been an instrument of the national government. <coughs> but the new high representative also has his competences as vice president of the commission. And as you know, still, the commission is the most powerful European institution uh, in front of the member states. Therefore, the new high representative can enter additional leverage, and therefore, uh, I think, will be more influential than uh, the one we have right now. The third element, uh, which from the strategic point of view might be the most important one, is that we are uh, in the treaty provisions foresee a joint diplomatic service all around the world. And, you know, our old friend uh, Jacques Delors once said, uh, nothing can be achieved uh, against the people but nothing will maintain without institutions. And uh, if you are building up now a joint diplomatic service of the European Union all around the world, I mean, a bureaucracy is a bureaucracy with all the tendencies uh, to develop, to gain influence, to, to gain power. So I think that this is maybe from a structural point of view the most important the most important provision in the new Lisbon Treaty concerning, uh, concerning foreign and security policy. Therefore, if this treaty is implemented, there is a chance for progress, which doesn't mean that after four or five years, uh, <coughs> European uh, foreign policy will be instead of the national ones. But uh, it will have a stronger say. And therefore, I think we will have maybe competing opinions. We will have a European opinion which people can agree upon. And then you will have on special issues still some uh, prevailing uh, opinions of national governments. But I would uh, predict 
that uh, the space of common perception will be enlarged by uh, the setting uh, that we just decided. <coughs> of course, uh, how long it will last till we have a single uh, European foreign policy, I cannot predict. I only can say it will be the last. Well, I completely agree on, on this analysis, but I have to remember to, to, to the audience, to the students, that uh, foreign policy and defense policy and security policy are still under unanimity rule. I repeat, are still under unanimity rule. So this is a real progress. You have a, a person that uh, can really, uh, let's say, be both in the Commission and act in the uh, among the member states and so on, but uh, he needs the unanimity to take a decision the unanimity of a member state. And uh, so it's, uh, this is the problem uh, because I think that uh, as we shall see tonight for the future this is a stumble block for the future of Europe but uh, uh, also because uh, I think that if we want to make progress in this field, uh, we must uh, give confidence and, and you know and room to a partial agreement. Let's say uh, if UK and France uh, want to go on as they try to do in some manner with agreement on defense. We can go, go, go on together, putting uh, together some part of the army and so on. They uh, can do it, and this is now the only, mm, you know, viable thing that can be done. And I think that this is good, with the condition that the door remains open for any other country to come into the agreement. Because in Europe, if you have exclusive agreement, agreement between two, three, four, <coughs> seven, ten countries, that they exclude the others, this will be absolutely damaging for the future of Europe. Take the euro. The importance of the euro is that the doors are always open. Of course, doors are open not to not to at any condition. Are open if you feel the condition to be into the euro. But the euro started with 11 countries. We are already 16. And this gives you the idea that also the partial agreement can go up. So, in the case of defense and security policy, because of the unanimity for common decision, we can have room for partial union. For I am stressing this because the Lisbon one of the normals of the Lisbon Agreement that has not been very, you know, what is called that, it makes easier to make the uh, non-total agreement, they say the partial agreement among countries. And so you have more room to start with experimental uh, areas in this field. But I repeat, I completely agree with Alfred, uh, security, the defense will be the law. Sorry, the, the last chapter, because the sense of when you are in the European meeting, you know, the sense of uh, let's say belonging of of, of uh, the foreign policy is, is unbelievable. I had also a demonstration, uh, I already told you, I'm taking the same idea on, on the African policy. You know, it's, uh, uh, if we have to deal with when we have to deal with the Zimbabwe problem. It was clear that this was given in some sort uh, to Britain. Uh, the problem of uh, Ivory Coast, it was French. You know, mm, by, by nature, by, by tradition. Uh, and uh, this, was the, uh, no, this was the only way to have a policy. Because when you need the unanimity, either you discuss it, you have the possibility of any unanimity, otherwise, if you don't to be absolutely paralyzed as we were, you leave to some sort of chef de field to, to, to some leading countries 
you know, to read it and then, of course, uh, not all of us we were in agreement for the Zimbabwe policy. I absolutely was not in, in agreement. But uh, uh, look, uh, because uh, you, you must act, uh, there was some sort of shed with you. Uh, probably in the beginning, uh, the Minister <coughs> of Foreign Affairs, let us call it in this way, there will be some sort of chef de fil, and, uh, you know, he will be able to minimize the opposition and to have some common voice in, uh, in uh, the deal. Not, of course, when you touch a major problem. When you will touch relation with Russia, there will be a split, and there is no minister for affairs who can now, with, in the Middle East, as they really say, in the Iraqi war, you could uh, have also had Jesus Christ as business of Korea favor, or what you couldn't have any agreement, you know, because the split was so tough, so difficult, so tragic, that you couldn't agree on that. This is the real situation. So, uh, the progress is important, and uh, I stress the idea look, of having a diplomatic corps <coughs> that is much more important than than you understand, because uh, they prepare uh, uh, the, the bureaucracy is absolutely vital for taking decision. You know, it's uh, because uh, the prime minister or um, the commissioner they are overburdened by a lot of things. You know, they need briefs, they need that, and they this have a great influence to. Uh, shape the, w the will, the decision. And so, if you have an organized diplomatic corps, uh, it, this will make much easier to have one voice. Uh, when listening to Romano, two things came uh, to my mind. Uh, the one is different countries have different perceptions of what should be the European priorities. So at the beginning everybody thought if uh, Europe is a better Germany, then it's perfect, the German thought. And if the Italian thought if Europe is a greater Italy, then it's a very good Europe. And the Austrian thought if uh, Europe is a greater Austria, then it's a very good Europe. So many of the, all of the member states thought that uh, if Europe is very close to what they are on the national level, uh, then it would be a good Europe. The more sophisticated approach is the one that was uh, adopted by the United Kingdom. Uh, I recall that uh, even before Saint-Malo, uh, the historic meeting between the French and the and the British, the House of Lords issued a policy paper that was called How Britain Can Lead Europe. And the most eminent members of the House of Lords, among them uh, Lord Danburg and all the others, they developed a quite interesting strategy. They said Britain will only be able to lead Europe if Europe is playing to British strength. And they said it's very obvious. Where are the strengths of Britain? It's not the economy, it's not social affairs, etc., etc. It's the British army and the British diplomatic service. So if Britain... Probably it's better to give the information that now in Europe, by far, the strongest army is the British army. It's the British army. Because okay. generally people think that it's the German uh, or the French, you know. It's, it's the British By army. far, it's the British army. It's the British army. This is our information needed. <laughs> so as a consequence, when Europe should play to British strength, Britain was more in favor of an integration in the field of defense and security then in favor of an integration in the economic or in the social field. Because if Europe will be 
integrated in that policy area, there would be some sort of natural British leadership. And as they are smart, they decided at the beginning, well, we are going to share that with the French. That makes it more probable that it is going to happen. And what I want to underline by that is that different uh, aspirations what concerns the different levels of integration in Europe very much uh, have to do with the aspiration of some, especially of the bigger member states, uh, how they could lead Europe. The second element, which uh, Romano was mentioning and I think is quite interesting, uh, is when he said, naturally or out of tradition, uh, Zimbabwe was dealt with by the British and uh, uh, Cote d'Ivoire by the French, <coughs> etc., etc. It's interesting, no? Naturally. What does it mean, naturally? It means, of course, that all all they knew that still all the traditions, the colonial ones, uh, the historic ties, are still present in this European Union. And therefore, we all find it natural uh, <laughs> that the British are taking the lead uh, in the issue of Zimbabwe, which is, by the way, also the case uh, in some other issues. I mean, as an Austrian, I experienced that when questions of uh, the Western Balkans were uh, were on the agenda, of course, it was, I was always the first to be asked, what are we going to do? Uh, because, naturally, <laughs> there was a suggestion of competence that the Austrians could propose what we are going to do on the Western Balkans, despite uh, some historic uh, deficiencies, uh, if you allow me to say. But the old um, empire is still an empire, you know. Uh, it's, uh, yeah, <laughs> not really. No. <laughs> <laughs> not really, no. And, and it's also quite, uh, quite interesting, and one could continue uh, this list, no? that, for instance, our friends in Scandinavia are the ones that normally are raising their voice uh, concerning the Baltic states. And maybe with the strong support of the Scandinavians, uh, the Baltic states wouldn't have been a member of the European Union. And I think it's interesting to notice that even in the day-by-day -day politics of the European Union, uh, these traditions and these historic ties, especially in the field of foreign policy, are still alive. Yeah. But, and then, when there were to organize issue in Albania when there was a tragedy it was Italy but, you know, naturally they asked me to wait because there was knowledge uh, people really but they have to add one, one thing uh, there is a small chapter of foreign policy which uh, that is not foreign policy but is important I mean, uh, external aid uh, there is a strong uh, commission and European activity uh, so not only member states who individually they bring aid, but uh, there is substantial budget with a European policy uh, run by the Commission. Well, it's not foreign policy strictly, but you know, it's something. Can we pick up on this very line and follow one of the questions here? One of the questions concerned energy security for Europe. Now, I don't know which country would claim a special leading role in that. I think everyone does. Uh, and there are some very interesting sort of contending interests, especially with thinking about energy security vis-a-vis -vis Russia. So how would you, gentlemen, put that into the well, preceding conversation? This is one of the most controversial points of it, you know, uh, for a simple reason. Uh, oil you buy everywhere, gas, except liquefied gas, and LNG, and then we, we shall deal later, you need a pipe. And the pipe is a link, you know, and so uh, the gas policy has changed, you know, because as link, Europe, 
in three directions. The northern link, Norway, and before Holland, and then Norway, that has a lot of gas. But now, I stress this because now this is disappearing. It was great quantity, but uh, with no new fields, and so we think that in the next 20 years, this will all go to that. Then you have two big leaks. <coughs> the biggest one with uh, former Soviet Union, because this was done by Soviet Union, and I explain why. Because the pipes were going straight to Europe, uh, passing through Ukraine, because Ukraine was part of Soviet Union. Now it's not anymore part of Russia, and so this is the big problem we have. The other part of the pipes come from uh, South Algeria through Tunisia, Algeria directly to Europe and Libya. Uh, percentage of uh, gas coming from Russia, it differs 100% percent Balt Baltic states uh, close to 80, if I remember well, Germany, and then 38 to Italy, zero from Spain. And so, uh, and uh, 14 from France, because electricity that is produced through gas in France is mainly nuclear. France is the only European country in which you can do everything. Uh, and people agree. The sense of the state, they could do speed train without any problem uh, in Italy to, you know, to have uh, the <laughs> train you have to, 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 to talk with 100 local communities and then pass on the region and then uh, the representative of cows or animals, you know. And, 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 and uh, I spent days and nights for, for thinking you know, about but this is this is this, this is history. This is history. So that, uh, uh, I remember in my hometown, <coughs> where the line from Milan to Rome, the most important line, the traditional. Now we we have the high speed, you know, but uh, but it arrived to the city. They start that and go there because there was an owner of land who didn't permit to the duke to pass through with the railway. So you have up to 150 years. You still have the railway going. Now, you know, so this is this is history. But anyway, and you have this different picture, and this different picture uh, now it is making enormous split and enormous division in Europe. And uh, first of all, Russia wants to get free from Ukraine. Is an obsession, in my opinion, is uh, wrong in the sense that uh, it's much better to pay instead of building such a new pipe, you know, and to have some sort of agreement in, uh, with price in payment, you know. Uh, there are also good reasons, you know. I, I had in my life the necessity to mediate uh, between Russia, European Union, and Ukraine because uh, there was a spillover of gas in Ukraine that was enormous, you know, so you started with 100 in the pipelines, and the pipeline went out with 70, you know, so then, then you went <laughs> to, was simply stolen, yeah, absolutely stolen, you know, and uh, uh, so there is this long history of tension, uh, and of also strange companies uh, owned by strange people that mediate the passage of the gas to Ukraine with Russian interest, to mix it to Ukrainian interest. So it's, it's much more complicated than the common opinion, you know, good and evil, you know, and, and so on. So, uh, in this situation, what has been done? The Russian has decided to uh, bypass Ukraine with two big pipes. One, the northern uh, pipe, you know, uh, uh, that, and this has given a lot of problems. It goes under the 
sea and arrived directly <coughs> to Germany, skipping Poland, I'm stressing back, skipping Poland, and the South Stream now under discussion that goes uh, through, crosses the Caspian Sea, 2,000 meters deep, you know, and then he arrived to Italy from south. The Black Sea. Uh, uh, mm, the Black Sea. Black Sea, Black Sea, Black Sea. Black Sea and comes, uh, and comes, uh, and comes, uh, no, comes from Caspian, Black Sea, yes, comes yeah. to Italy. Uh, to Italy and to Austria. There are two, South Italy and Austria in the north. And uh, uh, this is making a uh, terrible tension among European countries. Why? Poland is accusing Germany to make a policy against Poland. Then you see, you say, look, I simply had a fight arriving from Russia. I tried to mediate with the, with the Polish government, telling them, look, why don't we uh, link all the European pipes? Because it's so simple to have one common energy policy inside Europe, then when all pipes are linked, this problem of relation with Russia are minor. And second, when you have a monopolist, monopolist, and then a monopsonist, the buyer becomes stronger and stronger. But if you touch the relation with Russia, and in this moment, it is such a delicate problem that it was impossible to convince the Polish, the Czech, you know, to do that. So the <coughs> tension, the fear that they have with Russia is so deep and so strong that you cannot be convinced to do that. So you have this situation of uh, a divergent policy between Russia. Russia, of course, is, uh, is trying to divide, well, it's trying to not an idea of this division. It was not Russia to divide Europe, but I, I think that they <coughs> are quite happy because they can make uh, uh, prices, uh, uh, you know, more easily, and so the European policy on this field we couldn't get any 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 agreement, even if it's a typical uh, school case in which you have convenience to have one policy. Last point, uh, nuclear power for the future. Uh, there is a change in uh, many European countries about nuclear power. Coming back of Italy, coming back of Germany, uh, France is going on. In the, uh, but I am very, very, very skeptical about that. You take a general decision when you have to decide all the leaders of the country, you know, the Nibi theory is going on and you, you not in my uh, backyard and so on. And in this moment, in Europe, you have only one, only one uh, nuclear power station building. It is in Finland with such a, mm, let's say, tension between the French builder and the mm, uh, Finnish government uh, for a simple reason that the cost is the double than, than the planet cost, you know, and so it's, uh, I don't know how it will go on, but this is a message that it will be not only the problem of uh, uh, local reaction, but also the problem of absolute cost of nuclear uh, power station. So, why I think of that? Because of the slow development of alternative energy, even if there is a, swift, a switch, and many countries give in incentive, different country by country, a strong incentive to, the, uh, to this uh, field. You know, uh, uh, I think that even in the future, you will have a dependence uh, of Europe energy from Russia and uh, African natural gas with a new increase of LNG uh, from Qatar, Nigeria, and so on. But LNG uh, is by, by nature costly, because you have to take the gas, to liquefy it, 
to transport to a ship and then to regasify again, in these two processes, you lose a lot of energy and so a lot of cost. You know, this is the situation that we have now with, uh, with, uh, with uh, Russia. I can make it a little bit more complicated if you want. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, 
republics of the Soviet Union are under enormous Russian pressure and most of them have already signed treaties so, so that they are long range long range, range treaties to send to, to Russia to send the gas to Russia and therefore the Russians say it's no problem <laughs> it's no problem I mean if you are buying the gas from Kazakhstan or from wherever at the end there is always written Gazprom so as long as we control it we are happy that you are building with Nabucco so if this is not the source to supply uh, geographically if you have the map of uh, this area in front of you uh, it's quite easy to get Iraqi gas into uh, the Nabucco pipeline if there once is one because um, the war has to be over then we have to circulate it so it will take quite some time till we are getting Iraqi gas if there is one you could have a pipeline connection with Qatar but the thing is that most of the Qatari gas is already controlled uh, by the American companies so in Qatar we are only talking about the surplus that they could produce so, and the real source is, of course, Iran. And this is, of course, an eminent political question, <laughs> as we know, because I can tell you now for hours, uh, and I'm an expert in the gas issue, um, that during my time of prime minister, every second day I had an American visitor. From a think tank, from the foreign ministry, or from other institutions, who tried to explain it, that it is not a good idea that OMV, this is the Austrian uh, gasoline company, and leading partner of Nabucco, has signed a memorandum of understanding with Iran about a gas supply that should be channeled into Nabucco. Because they said, well, this is a uh, complete contradiction to our policies concerning Iran. No? We are trying to increase the pressure on Iran, etc., etc., and you are signing this uh, memorandum of understanding. I said, listen, it's. Uh, we had the same visitor. Uh, you had the same visitor <laughs> because, because your company did the same. Uh, and I can tell you there were also some other Europeans who did the same, so the Austrians were not the only ones. Uh, uh, but we understand ourselves um, um, as the gas vanguard uh, because uh, uh, for 41 years we are already receiving Russian gas uninterruptedly without uh, any problem. So uh, uh, the Austrian case, uh, the Russians were okay. But of course it's a question of political priority. Are we saying it's a political priority that Europe should not be 100% dependent on the Russian gas supply, then we have to use alternative means that are there. Or we are saying, now the most important issue, that we are all increasing the pressure on Iran, uh, and therefore we cannot cooperate with them in the gas issue, making us 100% dependent on the Russians. So it's, uh, it's, um, it's not a nice choice, no? But one has to understand, in addition, that if the Europeans <coughs> are completely locking the doors in the gas question with Iran, it's very clear who will be there. Guess who? Of course, the Russians. <laughs> the Russians will also cooperate with the Iranians concerning the Iranian gas, because what they want is to create a monopoly of supply and they are ready then to sell the gas of course to Europe and uh, to China and elsewhere as long as the Gazprom brand <laughs> is at the end and of course we have to avoid and this is the political point of view we have to avoid that the Russians get a monopoly of supply because there is a tendency in the present Russian administration <coughs> that they use energy policy as part of power policy, which has
hasn't been the case for a long time now. In the old days, the the, the power of the Soviet Union Soviet was... Soviet Union was perfect. No, but the uh, Soviet Union... Supplier without <laughs> any problem. <laughs> yes, but, but then their power was built on their nuclear armament. <laughs> yeah? Then their power was built on their nuclear armament. And now they understood that they could build their power uh, on the monopoly of the of the energy supply. And this is why this is a political issue, <coughs> and this is why it's uh, specifically awkward uh, that the Europeans were not able to adopt uh, a common not. position. Yeah. Because it's not only the question of the gas, but it's the political question behind to allow by a split in Europe that the Russians are able to uh, develop their policy using energy policy as part of the power policy. Even more complicated, because uh, it's a question of time. Iran has a lot of <coughs> gas, a lot of gas, but now they are dealing with China for big, big pipeline. If there is a pipeline going to east, big enough, uh, then well, of course there is. A additional gas, but maybe not convenient, not enough to build pipeline to the west. Mm. So it's, uh, uh, it's not only a, a, a problem of decision making, but, but of <coughs> timing of decision making. So this is, uh, uh, but I repeat, the only remedy is have a common European policy in which, in case of scarcity, you may pump a little more from Africa, from LNG, you, you may have some sort of solidarity that now does not exist. Just to tell you one idea about quantities, just to have an understanding. Even if Nabucco is able to supply the 30 billion cubic meters of gas annually, this is less than the annual consumption in France. That is the scarcity. Less, less than the annual consumption. Well, to give an idea, the Northern Stream is 35 plus 35. Mm -hmm. hmm? Yeah, if I remember well. 70. There are two parts, <coughs> 35 each. So, only that is uh, the double, more than the double of the book. To have so an idea of what is Russia, you know. It's, uh, I can already foresee this will be a major conference, I think. You know, given the complexity, and actually given the, the relative ignorance, I think, of American foreign policy around European energy security issues. So, but I wonder if I could turn, turn the discussion toward another issue which is much more central within the American discourse, and then we'll put it on to the uh, broader discussion. Uh, but I wonder if I could draw, put two questions together for you, gentlemen. The first comes from Jeff Kopstein up at Toronto, he puts the question this way. Does Europe require military strategic capabilities beyond NATO? If not, what will bring it to the table with the Americans in terms of burden sharing? When EU officials speak of quote unquote soft power, is this not simply a refusal to engage in a genuine common foreign and security policy? And if I may, Let's think about that with regard to Afghanistan. Jeremy Surig puts a very specific question here. What is the emerging EU policy on nation building beyond Afghanistan? But I don't think we're beyond Afghanistan by any means yet. Well, nation building in the context of Afghanistan I do not know if this is ask us, yes. uh, is, is one of if this ask is the if this is <laughs> one of the if this is one of the best questions. Uh, but the thing is the following: I think that uh, nation building in Afghanistan is not the issue of the day. I mean, the last chance to have a nation building in Afghanistan was during the Soviet occupation, and uh, nobody had. Uh, had reached more in Afghanistan uh, than the Soviets uh, at the end of the 70s. And one has to understand that, uh, of course, out of obvious strategic reasons, 
the Americans didn't want to allow that success of the Russian occupation and sponsored the different uh, tribal and other resistance forces that were fueled into, into Afghanistan. And this project uh, has been destroyed <coughs> out of geostrategic uh, reasons. But one has to say that the Russians, or the Soviets, uh, at uh, the end of the 70s, beginning of the 80s, uh, have reached much more than the Brits ever have reached in Afghanistan. Nowadays, I think uh, Afghanistan is, uh, is a destroyed society, far away from uh, being a state. And uh, I do not see any chance for the time being to build there something like a nation or to build there something like democracy. I think that uh, one should reduce uh, the political targets concerning Afghanistan to the fact that we try to eliminate uh, the terrorist uh, bases there in Afghanistan, which by the way has happened to a large extent with the disadvantage that most of the terrorist camps are now not in Afghanistan, but are in Pakistan. And uh, at least due to my analysis, uh, <coughs> the problem that is, uh, uh, that is just coming into existence, the problem of Pakistan, is much more difficult, much more dangerous than uh, the situation in Afghanistan. <coughs> and if we are focusing all our endeavors on Afghanistan while leaving uh, the Pakistani issue aside, developing on its own, I think we are all uh, captured in a huge trap because the result will be that uh, progress in Afghanistan will be very modest and at the same time uh, the greatest danger is uh, building up in Pakistan. And this is uh, one of the issues where I uh, do not agree with uh, President Obama, maybe the only one, all the other aspects uh, so far I could share, but I think uh, prioritizing Afghanistan militarily under the present conditions, in my understanding, is not, is not the right choice. The second thing uh, connected with that uh, are Europeans prepared for a real burden sharing or is the talk about the soft power uh, just an escape clause for real action? I think Afghanistan shows that Europeans are ready to contribute, unfortunately uh, in the wrong case. <laughs> I understand it so. There would have been better cases for a stronger uh, European involvement in Afghanistan, but uh, I mean, what the German army, for instance, uh, is doing in Afghanistan is, uh, has been inconceivable for decades. Who would have uh, uh, who would have imagined in 1980 or 1985 uh, that the German army ever would play a role, uh, for instance, in Afghanistan or in a comparative case? Uh, than the one that they are playing now. So I think that uh, uh, the readiness of the Europeans for uh, burden sharing has been indicated, but unfortunately I think that uh, Afghanistan is the wrong place to demonstrate to demonstrate this readiness. May I interrupt you? Of course. Because uh, Europeans are ready to share, but the problem is which share? European uh, politically, no European country except UK and the big France wants to have a substantial military budget. And even in UK and even in France, the pressure are not increasing. And so, so burden sharing, but with a very small, small share of the burden. This is what really, so the idea of soft power is some sort of uh, bad conscience. Know the problem <laughs> is, uh, so it's dancing with the words, in my opinion. You know. uh, so even in, in Afghanistan, clearly we engage it. You know, in Iraq, I was against. My government was against. We sent the troops because the previous government did. 
I withdrawn then as soon as I arrived to the government. It was a clear case. In Afghanistan, it was a common engagement because it was a, a shared, it was a shared decision, you know. And so we stayed there. But any time that I, not only me, but any European leader, try to increase the troops of more than two soldiers, two additional soldiers, you have problem with the parliament. We did an extraordinary way for the election, but then the day after the election are over, let us withdraw our 400 um, soldiers that we sent. And so it's true that we are engaged in Afghanistan, but throwing the fields, dragging the fields, you know, and trying to minimize our presence. You know, I, uh, Italy has the responsibility uh, of a uh, north uh, uh, west area, Parat region. And um, in terms of statistical casualties, as less, uh, less difficult than others, you know. And whenever uh, we were asked to help the other region, my état major, my general, uh, they were all telling, no, never, never, never. We have taken this engagement, we keep it, we are loyal, but please don't ask us more. And I couldn't send planes for uh, bombing, only transportation, because this was the initial engagement. So, so. so it's true that we are in Afghanistan, it's true that we are loyal, but it's true that we minimize all our collective effort in Afghanistan. Even the UK has a lot of problems, a lot of political problems. You know. And uh, the last casualties have opened a debate. And so clearly uh, uh, this is the truth. And second, you told uh, that Obama has prioritized Afghanistan. But please, you know, 100 things better than, uh, than, than I know, you know, but uh, reading the papers and the reports, he has prioritized it, but then he has, ba he has bought time, you know, because uh, and before sending troops, you know, and when Bush was asked, he immediately sent troops, you know. Here, we are in a different situation. I, I don't know if we send troops. Probably, yes, but I don't know. Clearly, I don't know. Will he send? How many? Because uh, personally, I completely agree that uh, you don't win in Afghanistan with troops. The Russian, they, you know, you cannot imagine the engagement of Soviet Union in Afghanistan. They did the most well. The Americans have better electronic warfare, you know, but uh, the fire effort of Russia was enormous uh, and then they would go. Because you have to deal. You have to deal. You have to deal. With that, why don't we turn it over to you all. What questions, comments do you all have? Um, I had a question about um, the oil and natural gas policy uh, topic. Um, if the EU decides to engage with Iran on energy and oil and natural, on energy and oil and natural gas issues, how do you think this maneuver will affect EU relations with America since currently the political zeitgeist is to be isolating and wrapping up pressure on Iran, not engaging with them? Well, I honestly think that now it's impossible to build the pipeline with Iran. But what I think is that uh, the Iranian problem you know, must you know, have a solution in the sense that, uh, <coughs> well, this is my personal opinion, you know, Iran already got what he wanted. I clearly told to uh, Bagilijan when I met the United Nations, I said, uh, I, I said you know, uh, I, uh, you wanted to become a regional power. You are already. No doubt about that. So what do you want more? What do you want more? So when I, uh, uh, you know, when I told that, he told me, what, uh, what do you mean? I said, look, President, 
I want to be more clear. When I was uh, a teenager in my high school in my city, there was a beautiful girl. You know, everybody was courting her. She said no to everybody, and then I found her alone ten years ago, very sad. I don't want the Tehran to find in the same situation, you know, in a few years. Then when I, when I met, <laughs> look, but when I, last November, when I was in Iran for a, a meeting of religious leaders with Katarina, you know, he wanted to see me, and then he said, Professor, how is your friend? He's <laughs> <laughs> still alone? He said, yes, she's still alone, you know. Uh, because rationally, Iran, uh, well, of course, they, they have internal problems, so you never, it's difficult to meet this. But there is a moment, because the general interest is to deal now, because they are so strong, there is a moment, there will be a moment, in which some sort of agreement must be possible, you know, because uh, rationally, it's, a, it, it's foolish for Iran <coughs> to go on, 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 indefinitely. Of course, it's they have internal political tension, this may happen, you know, because politics is politics. <coughs> but in terms of racial interest, Iran, uh, for Iran now is the time to deal. I have always interpreted the nuclear threat in Iran <coughs> as hard twisted in order to have a higher recognition, you know. And for America and for West the world, honestly, look, Iran is the only big country with a big population, with the bourgeoisie, with strong culture in the area. Let us be clear, you know, uh, population, land, energy, resources, culture. So, how can you have an influence in the area if you in some way don't deal with Iran? Only, you can only trust in Saudi Arabia, uh, yeah, Saudi Arabia is strong, important, energy, so on, but uh, the number of people, the type of culture, you know, whatever. so this is why, uh, 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 in this moment, I tell you, clearly, it's impossible to deal with Iran, but uh, we are, in, in foreign policy, we have also to, to try, to try to understand that if there are long-term interests, you must keep them in mind. This is my idea about Iran. You know, and you know, uh, I've been many times in Iran. I, I was also the only Western leader to have an official visit to Iran in 1997, and I did it uh, after mm, an agreement with Clinton. You know, I, uh, because uh, you know, I'm not an amateur or a naive to do that. You know. And uh, look, uh, I. Uh, I convinced him <coughs> with this word, you know, telling you, but how can you not have a, a, you know, a dialogue with uh, this country, even if there are tensions, if, 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 if there are problems, you know, and uh, uh, so it's, uh, and it was a moment of tension in France, you know, and I told him, look, uh, uh, there are complaints that France is doing this and that, you know, but Clearly, if Russia is together with uh, Ukraine, strongly together with Ukraine and Iran, the Soviet Union, without Ukraine and Iran, it's Russia. So uh, there is also this type of, 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 uh, of inter interest, objective interest to, to think of that. But then, of course, in this moment, I agree, uh, you can't have a dialogue because I don't want to have a dialogue. Trying to think <coughs> in about the future, you know. I do not want to disagree. Uh, I just want to add that I think uh, the development uh, around the Iranian presidential election are irreversible. So I think that uh, <laughs> Ahmadinejad is now in a different position than he was before. And I don't think that uh, there will be eternal patience in Iran if uh, the president is acting against the objective interest of the country. <coughs> the 
second thing is uh, they are now geostrategically <coughs> the most important power in the area. And uh, with the withdrawal of the troops from Iraq, uh, their influence will not <coughs> decrease, but quite the contrary. The Iraq of today uh, is a weakened Iraq, which uh, of course uh, cannot play the same role than it uh, played before when once Iraq was used uh, in order to, to balance the Iranian revolution. Uh, the new Iraq will be weaker, and therefore the Iranian influence uh, uh, in the area will increase. The third element, uh, interestingly enough, uh, even if uh, we did not reach a conclusion, the talks last week in, the, in Indiana and beyond of the International uh, Atomic uh, Energy Agency uh, have been uh, have been quite constructive, so to say. I mean, we are not yet uh, at, the, at the result we want, but I think that the, the trend uh, is a positive one. Uh, and I would agree that nowadays it doesn't <coughs> make sense to, uh, to adopt individual policy lines concerning the Iran, but my conviction is that uh, sooner or later we're going to enter uh, a dialogue with Iran, and uh, sooner or later we are uh, going to cooperate with Iran on the exploitation of their gas resources, uh, and this will lead to a much better situation that we are in right now. To other additional points, um, in the question also. First thing that I, I told to to, to Madini that was please when you go back <coughs> to Tehran build the monument to George W. Bush because he destroyed all your enemies. <laughs> this was the fact he was absolutely magnanimous. <laughs> Second, did, did they start building it already? <laughs> <laughs> Second, uh, you told the power of Ahmadinejad. This is of course mysterious. Thing, you know, uh, is he really the first power in the country? I don't think so. I, 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 my experience is different. You know, when I have seen acting Akhmadinejad and Khamenei, uh, Akhmadinejad has, has a sense of devotion vis a vis Khamenei, yeah? mm -hmm. clearly. Then people say that Khamenei is dying or, uh, you know, like, uh, there are things that I, I really don't know, but, you know, uh, you, in, in the meeting you, you, you see how how the power is placed. I was with uh, Kofi Annan, we were together, and clearly the sense was that the religious leader was, was the Lord, you know, this is my impression, but, you know, uh, so, so, so difficult to understand the internal uh, way of that. And we're very clear we need much more expertise on Iran. Yes, yes. Um, I, I actually wanted to get you back to the beginning of the conversation where you were describing the present situation via the foreign policy and the common, you know, the, the assuming that the Lisbon Treaty is, is adopted, this uh, you know, new, new direction in terms of a, a common European foreign policy. And and your description was very interesting on two counts. One is, I, I was fascinated by the convergence in your in your comments on a sort of uh, the almost a bureaucratic uh, foreign policy creep that you were that you were describing. In the long run, fascinating, run. right? So, so Europe sort of you know growing through through this bureaucratic diplomatic core. Um, but but what struck me most about the tenor of your comments was that both of you, despite being sort of heads of government in your respective governments, seem on the whole quite favorable to the idea of increasing uh, European common foreign policy. And I wanted to get to find out if this is correct. I mean, is this something that you are in favor of, increasing common foreign policy coming out of Europe? Or is this you know, just something that you're descriptively wanting to keep sort of uh, neutral, um, and if you are in favor of it, what would be the areas of foreign policy that you think that 
should nevertheless be retained? I mean, are there any reservations or spaces that you think are, are really should be kept outside of the ambit of Europe? Say, say you one more. You know, uh, when I talk about that with my students here, I used to make this example that I repeat, I know that I am boring, but you know, I am Italian. In the Renaissance, the Italian states were living in all the fields. I repeat to everybody, all the fields. Technology, science, armies. Uh, there was the first globalization, the discovery of America, <coughs> big ships, big things. The Italian state didn't stick together. Italy disappeared from the world map. Germany, France, Italy, Italy, United States, uh, China, India are in the same situation. This is not an only favor, it's a necessity. But as Italian state did, Italy did, we can lose the appointment with the history. This is what I think. But it's necessary. You know, uh, China is 25, has 25 the population of Italy, 25 times. Mm -hmm. Oh, you do. What do you do? Mm -hmm. U.S. territory, land, population, influence. What do you do? What is Germany, even strong Germany now in this in this new world? What is that? Of course, we can lose because we are so divided, you know, because history is history. It's quite interesting uh, that we uh, we share the same point of view on this issue because there might be a difference between the bigger and the smaller European countries. So uh, maybe what Romano said will not be entirely shared by the French and by the Germans. No, it's not shared. It's not shared. It's not shared. <laughs> because they still try to, let's say, maintain their, uh, uh, their individual foreign policies uh, for a country of the size of Austria, and we got accustomed to in the last decades that we are a little bit smaller than we were already. Uh, for us, it's much easier to uh, accept that uh, a joint European, common European policy uh, is much better than, let's say, our individualistic one, uh, especially if you do not uh, uh, see that as a passive exercise, uh, especially if you think you could uh, uh, co-shape uh, a common foreign policy in the areas where you are mostly interested in. <coughs> I mean, a country like Austria, for instance, does not have the capacity to I mean, have a dis to play a decisive role in all the foreign policy subjects, this would be ridiculous. Right? But there are areas of our priority. Let's say the situation in the uh, Western Balkans and for a long time uh, Central and Eastern Europe and, and other issues, and where we think this is a priority <coughs> for us, we are trying to co-shape <coughs> European policy, <coughs> and this also from our evaluation is much more effective uh, than going our own way. Now, you never forget the old joke that was common in the Mao period. You were a kid, you know, don't remember. You know. <laughs> there is a minister who goes to President Mao and say, Look, the Swiss army is invading China. And Mao answered, in which hotel they are? <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, this is picture of history. Um, I hope this is question is apropos. I, I was going to continue a little bit further with the Iranian discussion, if that's all right. Um, I thought we got to a very interesting point in in your discussion, where it seemed to me it was a natural, it was natural for the audience to ask, 
whether you gentlemen would care to speculate just a little bit as to what some of the factors involved in some kind of a grand bargain might be, if, if that's not politically too sensitive. Because I, I, I think you're on the verge of saying that such a grand bargain is possible and perhaps ultimately inevitable. Perhaps you could talk just a little bit more about what might go into it. <laughs> Not easy to make the shit out of here, you know. First of all, let's say uh, I was talking about the rational view, but some incident may happen. Huh? I don't exclude that uh, in this uh, non controlled uh, Middle East policy, you could have uh, some final clash. Huh? Oh, of course, of course. So, uh, CP, I was telling when I try to see the long-term interest, which will be, which will be uh, the long-term interest, the Shadaria to write that. Honestly, I am unable to answer. Absolutely unable to. Answer. It depends upon how <coughs> the negotiations go, uh, how they want to, to twist the arm to the last moment, because you know. The Iranians have been unbelievable in this year. Uh, 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 you know, a step ahead, a step back, a step ahead, a step back, a step ahead. A step it, it, you know, it's, uh, for hours and hours and hours and hours. So, it's, uh, of course, if the internal situation uh, is not solved, an incident is always possible. I don't know if you. If you this this uh, pessimistic uh, possibility, you know, it's, uh, the, the, uh, the Israeli the kind of situation. <coughs> possibility is there because if uh, if the Israeli public uh, uh, gets the impression that uh, let's say the the destiny of Israel is sacrificed uh, to a deal. Some might uh, take the opinion that they have to act uh, on their own. And there have been already the statements <coughs> by uh, people uh, in Israel who clearly stated that they will exercise their right of self-defense. Uh, and that, of course, then could uh, uh, provoke uh, different uh, counter-reactions. Uh, and could end up in a huge mess. At the moment, at the moment, and I underline that, um, I do not have that fear uh, because, due to my observation, things were becoming a little bit better uh, in this autumn. I thought in spring the situation was already a more ardent one than it is right now. Uh, but you know, the internal political situation is in Israel is also a mess. I mean, it's uh, <laughs> uh, quite, uh, quite difficult uh, uh, to predict. But if we analyze the general trend, if there is one, now, at the end of October, I'm more optimistic <coughs> than I was at the end of June. Is there absolutely no possibility that Israel itself might become part of the grand bargain? Is that absolutely ruled out? It's not ruled out. No, it, it is necessary, in my opinion. It seems necessary. to me that... Yeah. In my opinion, it's necessary. Yeah. But the problem is, uh, how can you settle the Israeli and pro the, the problem of Palestine, you know, that they are connected, you know? Because if you don't solve the Palestinian problem, it will be absolutely impossible to have uh, uh, Iran and Israel bargaining. No, and in addition, of course, part of the great bargain then, of course, has to be the situation in Lebanon and uh, yeah, in all the area. Yeah. And the Israeli-Syrian question, so we are talking about a new seminar. <laughs> Another opportunity to get together. I think we have one more. It's time for one more conversation yeah, um, here. I guess I'll be the idealist here and bring up human rights. Um, so 
the EU, I would say, has established probably a pretty solid human rights regime with like many of our sticking towards the ICC and you have the European Court of Human Rights. But when you talk about energy security, I feel like human Can rights. Speak? Yeah, Don't sure. Worry. Um, when you talk about energy security, I feel like human rights often kind of gets left off the table. And when you're dealing with countries like in Central Asia and with Russia, where who have massive human rights violations, I'm just wondering how you think the EU can reconcile its commitment to human rights and also its needs for energy security. You never reconcile in theory. You know, you you bargain. You know, the situation. Uh, my honest answer is that uh, you have not an handbook to reconcile this, but uh, case by case uh, you have to see which is the best pressure, the best way of pressing in order to have human rights respected. I am not a general doctrine about that. I find myself very often in difficult, uh, in difficult situation. You know, it's, uh, for example, even if I had hours and hours and hours conversation with Putin with all the problem, I could never talk about Chechnya with him. I do remember when I went to him and told look. Uh, there is an Italian NGO who want to build an, hosp an hospital in Grasne. I think that is important because the situation is so bad. You control it, please. But, um, I think that is important that you do it, you know. And he told me, look, I never spoke about Chechnya with any non-Russian. And I don't accept to speak with you of any problem concerning Chechnya. What do you do? You declare a war to Russia? But I put you a case in which I found myself. I tried to explain <coughs> it was interesting, you know, because if you have a hospital with uh, you know, medi me medicines, you know, and so on. Then you have some problem, you can use it also, uh, some sort of mediation. This was clear. In principle, this an entire Russian problem. There is a national sovereignty. Don't break the law. I think there is uh, no standard formula for the uh, pursuit of uh, human rights, but I think one should learn from historic uh, experiences. And uh, if we think that the <coughs> revolution in 1989 uh, in Central and Eastern Europe has one has been one of the major steps in order to spread human rights around the world. One has to question uh, how this uh, developed, and of course, a lot had to do with uh, the enormous uh, pressure on armament and the costs that were involved for the Soviet Union. A lot had to do with an economic model that uh, was not sustainable and could not uh, fulfill uh, the aspirations of the people. But I think what uh, sometimes <coughs> is neglected is the process of detente that started in the 70s and that led to the famous three baskets uh, of the Helsinki Final <coughs> Act. And the three baskets were the first one, that both sides accepted the existing borders of Europe. The second basket was uh, economic cooperation. And the third basket was the issue of human rights. And most of the human rights initiatives that came into existence in Russia or in the 
Soviet Union and in other uh, countries. No? Remember the Charter 77 in uh, Prague, for instance, or remember Sakharov and others. They all were referring to basket three of the Helsinki Final Act, where there was an agreement on the pursuit of human rights. So this, uh, let's say, international treaty was offering legitimacy to human rights activities, especially uh, in the communist countries. And I think that this was therefore a very important step <coughs> forward in order to first prepare the change and second to have a more uh, wider spread of human rights in that area. <coughs> and this is not the only historic experience one could recall, but it's one that um, I think is interesting to be remembered and where <coughs> one could build on. And in many ways, it seems like that concluding question and discussion is the most appropriate starting point for thinking about Watson futures. The Watson Institute, you know, was founded around the question of how to prevent nuclear holocaust between the Soviet Union and the United States. And today, the question about all of these issues that we're discussing here, energy security, human rights, military security in various states, they are all often pursued in isolation from one another. But clearly, they're all connected. The Helsinki Accords is a terrific reminder of how these things can be connected and how both the unacknowledged conditions and unintended consequences of such diplomatic efforts cannot be anticipated. But what we can do is to learn from that history in order to anticipate these alternative futures. And I can't imagine a better way to do that than to have guests like we have here and to have conversations like we've just had. So in anticipation of tonight's debate, let us just conclude for the moment and thank our distinguished guests and thanks to all of you. Thank you.